Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I am here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is burnout and how to get past it. Ah, <sighs> burnout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is not something that um, anybody's going to have any real struggle understanding uh, what but, it is. But let's just define it anyway. What is burnout as it is applicable to fiction? Okay, for whatever reason, uh, sooner or later, some part of your fiction will cause you to just really not want to write. And uh, it can be, well, I don't want to write the thing I'm writing, or I just cannot write. And it, it's, it, it can happen at, at the weirdest possible times. Yeah, so let's let's talk about like our own experience with burnout as far as some of the issues that we have faced. Okay, well, my most recent one was Dead Man's Party, um, where I was going along great guns and had written, had done the whole first draft at one hour a week as a video demo, and then uh, did the revision and was had written all brand new chapters for the first thing and those were flying you were just along. excited too you oh, were I really was excited having, yeah i was having the best time it was cannibals and zombies and science fiction and fantasy and uh ais and uh, a role-playing game and all of this awesome stuff and then i got to know the villain and the villain turned out to be a villain that I personally simply could not write but he was the perfect villain for the book and I I tried I tried so hard to to write him and write the thing but my my just I stopped it just I hit this wall and and then I just didn't want to write at all and I was sitting there um doodling on notepads and uh, reading my emails before I did anything else and all of these and, and checking, checking the internet. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Running into other things that were taking you away from the writing as a distraction, but you just couldn't. I just couldn't write back. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how about you as far as a, a, well, an, I've had a couple of things where, so for you, it was a character Mm -hmm. that the book absolutely needed that would make the book its best self that you could not write. Yeah, he was absolutely the right character, but I was absolutely the wrong writer to write him. Yeah, and that's that's a great way to put it. Um, for me, it was, at one point, it was fan fiction. I was trying, I guess you could say, I ha I was trying to burn the candle at both ends as far as the writing went. I was writing fan fiction and I was trying to dive into original fiction and it was kind of like trying to ride a bike at full speed while still having your training wheels on um a lot of people out there will always only ever write fan fiction and that is great because that is what they love that is what they enjoy that is I've got friends who tried to write original fiction and then learn they didn't want to. And mm -hmm. that's fine. It's about what you love. For me, I was burning out on fan fiction. Um, it, it can be, for me, it was limiting in not a good way. And then it was still the training wheels. Like I still, I still had that anchor. And it was a safety net. The, the pre-built worlds and the pre-built characters. Yeah. Fan fiction yeah. has all of this stuff. And then the pre-built knowledge of your reader coming in is huge 
the knowledge that the reader has of that story because they are out there looking for that particular story, your particular take or twist on the world that's already built, characters they already love. That is a huge safety net. And I was wanting to get into original fiction. I wanted to to build my own stories. I wanted to build my own characters and, and build my own worlds. And it was scary. So I burned out on fiction in general for a while. You know, I'd still write down story ideas. I could never, ever stop writing down the story ideas, which was yeah. really an indication and an indicator that this was something that I loved. So with that, with that writing the stories, ideas, or writing the character ideas, or having all of these really cool, neat things still popping into my head, it's an indicator that it wasn't lost. My muse was still there. Fiction, it still loved fiction. I was still reading like, you know, a monster, um, <laughs> just a, a fierce reader, but I burned out. And recently, I felt the same thing probably two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. It was right before we started doing the podcast. And I got past it, but it was on romance. I was burnt out on writing erotica, on writing romance, on these other things. And again, it was a safety net. That was what I had built my fiction skills on mm -hmm. after fan fiction. So there was the writing skills with fan fiction. There was the original fiction with romance. And I was burnt out on it because romance, I really did love it. But it wasn't, those weren't the stories that I really wanted to tell. Right. And leaving Juan de Lucia and the sequel, which still has no name, <laughs> and a possible third, if I get the chance to write them, they are different because they had that suspense element. Mm -hmm. That was what clicked in my head was that I couldn't continue to write just regular romances because I was burnt out on them. I didn't want to write them anymore. The The twist that made it interesting for me was the suspense. So when you and Matt read Leaving Wanda Lucia and, and you said, yeah, this is one of the better books that, you know, we've, we've read. It, yeah, it was by, genuinely good. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> not better books in the world, but better books, you know, from, from me, it was, it was the best thing I had written. It was genuinely publishable. That's when I realized that the burnout that I got over with switching to romantic suspense mm -hmm. meant that it was time for me to move on to something to the bigger thing again. Yeah, the thing that you genuinely want. Yeah. So yeah. those are those are typical ways. Th those are those are some of the ways that you can experience burnout. I know that you have experienced burnout by pushing yourself too hard. Oh god, yeah, when I was working 16-hour days um because I would do these have these deadlines and we were we were just making it by the skin of our teeth. Uh, teeth. <laughs> yeah, and you you've said before that if you didn't write and finish, we didn't eat. Right. After that book was done and submitted, you you just didn't want to write anymore. Right. There is there is a price that comes from not just not just the writing which you love, but the pressure of and the the gut fear of <laughs> seriously. I've got people to feed and the the money is coming from the book that I have to count on the commercial publisher paying me for on time after I send it in. If I send it in on time and if I'm late, yeah. then we have a problem. And it was just scary. And yeah, I, I got burned out numerous times doing that because that shit will eat you. Yeah, so it's like if you're writing the wrong thing, if you're writing the character that is right for the thing that you're doing, but you've you would hurt yourself by writing that character. Mm -hmm. If you're writing the wrong genre or if you're not, you know, if, you, if you're writing and pushing yourself too hard and expecting too much out of yourself and not 
giving your muse the time that it needs to recharge, those are all ways that you can burn out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the idea here is how do we get past that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there are, are steps. <laughs> and, and the first step is just to walk away for 24 to 48 hours. Don't think about fiction writing the book play well it's kind of like meditation right if it pops yeah. up in your brain which it probably will just acknowledge the thought and let it go yes yes exactly but do not um do not focus on it at that point do something to distract yourself do non-thinky stuff um just get lost in a cheesy book. Oh, yeah. Read somebody some... else's stuff or, or play a video game that requires a fair amount of, yeah. of eye-hand coordination and... Binge watch a television show that yes. you either have seen before and you deeply love and want to see again or haven't seen before. Yes. Yeah. Um, or, or just <laughs> fall into seven million episodes of I Love Lucy. Or clean. Uh, that's one thing that I've, I've noticed that a lot of us... Um, there's, a, there's this thing with a lot of writers where we're... And this is not everybody, but we're not the most attentive to the household chores. No. Um, yeah. And and you're lucky because Matt is the opposite of that. He is very attentive. He's very clean. My husband loves to admit that he is lazy. Um, he does not clean. So that falls on me. And I don't have a problem cleaning because I love the idea of a clean house. I'm just not very good at executing it. So some of the time when I have my burnout phases or I have decided to take the two days to recharge, I'll clean. And it's not necessarily fun at first, but once you start seeing the immediate results, <laughs> that's something that your fiction is not giving you if you're burning out. So I'll tell you one thing. There is something about cleaning that gives you that immediate result that gives you that dopamine in your head it, that or, or fixing something changing a freaking light bulb yeah, and it seeing pays the light you. come on yeah it pays you and that's yeah. something that if you're burning out your fiction is not probably not doing at that moment so it's a, it's an odd thing to tell somebody to to go clean or to go um go recharge in a different way go fix things or garden but yeah absolutely okay so our next step here is step two ask what poke your burnout until you figure out the exact thing you cannot stand to look at again or for a while this can be something like character or genre or series or world and we both have had a little bit of fun with yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My most recent thing was the character problem. But uh, at one point, I just absolutely burned out on high fantasy. And I started digging around for uh, other things that I could write. And that was the point where I wrote Cadence Drake, and which is science fiction, kind of uh, far future, high tech. But at the same time, sort of urban science fiction mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with vampires. And uh, that was that was a really good break for me. Um, how about you? Um, I've I burned out on fan fiction. And then I made that that little like mid writer type crisis. I've gone through this a couple of times. I burned out on romance. Um, yeah. and I'm, I had to switch genres. Um, when I burned out on, there's, there's so many different things you can burn out. If you're burning out on a particular piece, uh, finding why can be a, a struggle because you, like you, you say you have to take the break and 24 to 48 hours is a good break if you're on a deadline or something like that, but sometimes it's going to be longer. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're not writing for a living, if you're also if you've also got a job and or kids or family or whatever, um, it can take even longer to get you into 
the right mindset. Yes. And I have burned out on a piece, on several pieces, and just let them die. And they're they're hard drive zombies or whatever now. But that is a really, really good point. Is that sometimes it can be just the specific thing you're working on. If you have been writing the same book for five years or seven years and you haven't gotten to the ending yet and you keep starting back over and trying to do it again, Mm -hmm. it's time to put that one aside and do something else to come up with a different idea, to cut yourself loose. And the, the one for me that is most memorable for just crashing me was not not even the, the most recent Dead Man's Party. It was Talismana because yeah. I wanted that one so badly. And, you know, because it was basically you were my main character and, and Fred, Fred was in it. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I made the horrific mistake of pantsing the damn thing. Yeah. And I... It kept going in new and exciting directions, and none of them connected to each other. And I went back, and there was just nothing I could save. And I I looked at it and went, well, I could go through and just gut the whole thing. And at some point, I still might, because I love the characters. I love the premise. But, and I love you and Fred in there. I really do. (laughs) Yeah, and for anybody who doesn't know, Fred was a uh, basset hound, and Mark's quote the best dog in the world to mark and he was he was a wonderful basset hound he and was he was yeah. he was just awesome he was yeah. a great great little guy big such guy. a freaking goof yeah. yeah but it was it was a fun story and and i could see like so sometimes you burn out on stuff that you really do have to put aside and then sometimes you burn out on stuff that you really want to to write and you want you haven't been working on it for five or six years, but you've just burned out. And sometimes it can be a particular subplot. I found that for some of them in the past, I found that it was subplots I felt I had to write. You know, subplots Mm -hmm. that or scenes that I felt needed to be in there and that I didn't want to slog through. And Holly goes over this in, in a lot of her courses, um, talking about, okay, well, the scenes that you need to write, do you really need <laughs> to write them? And how can you make them fun? And no, you don't have to write the boring parts because dear God, no. <laughs> dear God, no. If yeah. you're bored writing it, you're going to kill your reader. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, you don't want somebody to put down a book because you're going through a boring part and just like every time they pick up, the book think oh god i gotta get it through this section and then they never read finish the book but yeah were you gonna say something yeah i just had another realization while we were talking about this thing there is another kind of book that can just burn you out and it's the book you should write and mm-hmm. i am emphasizing the word should heavily you have told somebody a story idea or you have come up with this amazing, well, with, with this this idea for what you think would be a tremendous book, and somewhere along the way, someone you truly respect, or someone whose opinion you value enormously, or someone important in the industry, or something like this, says, you know what, you should write that. And it clicks in the back of your mind. Okay, that's the thing I'm going to write. And there it can be a very soul crushing thing. If you start writing it and it, it isn't the fit that you thought it was going to be, but in the back of your mind, you already have this approval of somebody else or this, this thing that you told yourself, this was the one and that you have to do this one before you do anything else just because you should. And that that's a very hard thing to move past, but to be able to write what you love, a lot of times you have to let go of the stuff that you should write. Yeah. And see, the, all of the burnouts that you're looking at are, are books that people kind of, need to give up I'm looking at the ones that people want to keep and Mm -hmm. if it's uh, sometimes like you were saying 
this is the book that you should that you feel like you should write even if you get rid of that expectation of should and you're writing it and it's still not coming out as you want a lot of people burn out because of that because their first draft isn't coming out at the right spot so if you tell yourself that thing that holly you know the quote that first draft is shit if you just accept that that can get rid of a lot of burnout because you are basically freeing yourself to to just write and get the shit on paper and know it's not going to be great and know that you can during revision find the ways to make it the book that you wanted but the the things that you can burn out are endless almost I mean if Mm -hmm. you're burning out on a book that you still want to write you really do kind of have to you owe it to yourself to narrow it down to what it is that is causing you that burnout, like you say. So it's if you're burning out, it just know that absolutely a Holly is what Holly is saying is right. Like you, maybe this isn't something that you really deeply want to write, but also know that there is still hope for that book. There's still hope for that story or that that series of stories. That if you can just narrow down what it is that's causing you issues then you can absolutely fix it and save it and come back to it with this amount of love. I burned out on Glass House um, twice because of two different issues that I had to figure out myself. Yeah. And I burned out um, on Leaving Wanda Lucia and then again on the book two in sections. But that was me knowing at that point that I didn't want to write the romance anymore, that I wanted to get into Fulton Hills, that I wanted to. And then when you guys, you know, liked what you read, (laughs) then it was like, yeah, okay, I think I'm ready. Right. Okay. So let me, let me point out that once you have identified the problem, if it's a character, a genre, a series, a world, and if it's not something that you are, are really need to just walk away from, then the next thing you do is you go to step three, which is to pivot. And what you are doing is, okay, you, you look at your character, your genre, your series, your world, whatever it is that was burning you out before. And you say, okay, well, let me brainstorm writing that does not use that element that has you so fried. Now, obviously, if, if the world is crushing your soul. Yeah. Um, then you, you still have to have world building. You still have to book, the story still has to exist within a world. It might not necessarily have to exist in that world. And this is where I am looking at right now with Talismana because, um, I did pants that and the world kept shifting and shifting and shifting and shifting. And now I have a lot more experience with dealing with this kind of thing. And I am looking at going back to the very first version of the world I used, which was where these fiction, these these books were coming to life. Where the dolls? Or, I mean, no, hmm? She wasn't. She wasn't a writer. She was a, a creator of little figures. Figurines. Right, but she got sucked into other people's worlds. Oh, okay. Yeah, and her her little characters and stuff um, were alive in a world and. Um, the characters of this writer whose work she had loved, fantasy writer who had kind of inspired her own work, were these, those characters were alive in a world. And I am thinking if I stopped there, if I really sat down and and built out the pieces of that world that I need to use and then wrote from there, I would be able to get the book back because the essential premise of the book is so so strong. Mm Mm-hmm. And the all of, all of the worlds were cool, but they just kept getting darker and grungier and meaner, and it lost the the spirit of the first thing that I built. It's funny that if you pants, you go dark. Yeah, yeah. I I, I should absolutely never pants because pantsing takes me deep down the well into <laughs> yeah in, into places in my soul that I do not want to look into. <laughs> well, that's that's um. Also, when you were talking about world building, that's another way that people can burn out, too, is thinking, oh, I should really get this magic system down, or I should really get this entire language and world and everything built. So if you haven't listened to the Create a Language and Create a Culture Clinic 
uh, workshop that we did. There's a free download. Again, you don't need an email. You can just download it straight from the site and create, you know, create with us because it was a really fun episode and we got some really cool stuff and you don't have to uh, Tolkien your world building before you start writing you know, doing that hen- tends to be a mistake because mm-hmm. then you end up building about 97 percent stuff you never use and you spend inordinate amounts of time on it. And it sits there and makes you feel guilty because you're not using all the stuff you built. Yeah. Uh, and it can that in itself can be a form of really screwing up your writing. Yeah. But it's different for everybody. But, yeah, that's just another way that you could burn out. Yeah. So um, as far as as trying to pivot. Mm -hmm. You want to brainstorm the element, you you want to brainstorm around the thing that is making you miserable. So if it's a series, um, it might be time to write a mini short in that series with a couple of new characters. Um, It might be time to move guys to a different part of the world. Um, it might be might be time to send everybody to Hawaii, which was what series fiction or, uh, television shows used to do. And you kind of knew at that point, well, this one's about to get canceled. Because <laughs> at the point where they sent everybody to Hawaii, they had run out of ideas. Allowing yourself to, to build like a little add-on to the existing world or a, a change in direction with new characters to existing series or to alter your genre a little bit like going from science fiction to science fantasy uh, which is more what Cadence Drake is because of the vampires or um, from romance to paranormal romance or from to just to just move a little bit away from the thing that makes you feel like you're locked in a cage and, and get just a little different view of it see if maybe that will help yeah, because sometimes it can just be a character. And when you're writing, you can switch. When you're writing first draft, and it can be a story or um, a novel, and you're finding you're burning out, and, and you know you do your examination and you find it's the character, you don't have to go back and change everything about that character and catch up. This is why we talk about just putting notes in our first draft so that we know when the switch happened and we continue going because just the thought of having to go back and revise everything up to that point makes you feel like you have to start over, makes you feel like you're never going to finish. It it, it buries you under this weight of obligation that you don't have. Mm -hmm. If you put that note in the book, like, okay, this is when the change is made and blah, 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 or whatever your note needs to be. And then you move on with that new, more exciting version of that character. You're going to continue to write, which is the important thing. And then you're going to finish that draft. The biggest thing in the world, like Holly says, like, well, she doesn't say it's the biggest thing in the world. That's me. But (laughs) Holly, Holly specifically says, you don't know what you need to change until you get to the end until you finish the book and it's very true it's 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 you're putting all this extra work on yourself and sometimes it is fear and procrastination or you know fear of finishing fear of of getting to the end and it being a letdown and it not being as good it's gonna happen first draft is gonna be a letdown in ways yes you know you rule one for all first draft is shit (laughs) <laughs> you're allowed to write badly in first draft and it's allowed you're allowed to have it suck it's yeah. allowed to be awful because it's first draft mm-hmm. it just all you have to do is get it done and and then let go of it let it sit for a while let the steaming pile cool and then go back in and take a look at what's there and save what's good and fix what's bad yeah yeah i just that that i found that a lot of people run into the the block because of perfectionism and oh, gorgeous yeah and just remember leave it leave it for future you <laughs> <laughs> just if you keep running into these issues and these parts and and you have to keep putting notes in just say i'll let future me deal with this and it's mm-hmm. it's also giving that inner critic its own chance to tear yourself 
apart because that's what the inner critic wants to do is tear the shit apart and fix it and and the muse just wants to play so continue writing with those notes just to get to the finish line just so you know you can do it <laughs> yeah yeah if it gets really dark and tense and you are just obsessively driven to fix this thing create an alter an alter ego give it a name like bob or stan or uh, matilda uh, brunhilda and say okay <clears throat> just in the side notes brunhilda has to fix this and then you move on <laughs> it's just so that you you can get it out of your mind you have made it somebody else's problem mm -hmm. you can let go of it and then when you come back in you'll make yourself laugh a little bit that okay brunhilda has to deal with this and you bring out your inner editor whom you have now given a horrible name <laughs> um <laughs> said um okay this is your problem yeah. and set yourself free mm-hmm so what's the next step? Okay, step four is experiment. Right outside your comfort zone. Use different voices or new techniques. Expand your repertoire in unrelated works. And this is um, after you finish something in your regular world, take some time to knock off a couple of um, uh, flash fictions in some completely different world uh, to invent a new character to and and just play allow yourself give yourself maybe a week away from some big project in which you play with something little and different and completely outside of the the thing that you are writing that you think of as the big thing um make it a no stakes thing you just tell yourself nobody is ever going to see this and then if you come up with something great that that you love they can see it but this is a job where you get paid to play. And it really, really matters that you remember that as long as you're playing and you're having fun, that is going to translate to the reader who reads it and who is into the kind of fun you're having. Mm -hmm. you're, you're never going to appeal to everybody. But but you, you, I, I watch Becky's face light up every time she talks about Fulton Hills about some new thing that has twisted or changed, about some character that has shown up, about some some new little area of the air in, inside of her world. I, I just... Yeah. Well, that's and that's what's really cool about Fulton Hills, too, is because um, I'm actually doing that, that play thing now. Um, I have gotten... This week I had gotten stuck on the revision, and I did find out why, and now I'm not worried anymore, but... I just was dreading going into the revision and I was like, something's wrong. So I couldn't really point it out, finger it or anything. So I started pulling up the flash fiction for um, the Gremlins mm -hmm. and for another set that uh, my friend Lee knows that I'm working on. But um, yeah, and, and it's it's still all in the Fulton Hills world. But the cool thing about Fulton Hills is it's, it's Fulton County. So there's all these different cities or towns and they all have different types of magic going on because the magic leaking interacts differently with the materials, with the earth, with the people, all this other stuff. Cool. And it's, it's almost like I get to go play in a different part of that world with different rules. So it's almost like a, a different world. And like the gremlins, the gremlins are specifically standing river. They're nowhere else. That doesn't mean they can't leave, but that means that that's where they are. And they're, they're a home kind of centric, um, creature. So, um, just getting in and farting around <laughs> with <laughs> these other characters. And I didn't even get to writing the flash fiction. I just started you know, playing around with what I had, mm -hmm. it clicked in my head. Ah, oh, yeah. that's what I was, that's the problem I'm having. Okay, well, I can fix that. So even just playing around some other place, um, opening up your muse to no rules um, or opening it up to new rules, new limitations, harder limitations even sometimes, can knock something free in your brain that tells you, oh, wait a minute. Okay. This is what I am dreading with, you know, current whip. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh my God. That's, um, and that is, that sort of experimental play is at the heart of building a career. It, it, it's, it is essential to give yourself that kind of freedom to wander around and take chances. Um, and then let's go to the, the last part of this, which is that your objective is to return home changed, to be a little different than you were when you were at this dark place where you were burned out. You want to come back a slightly different person than you were before. You bring your new skills to your old work. Um, you challenge yourself. You bring it back to life in ways you'll love. Um, you, you are a creature transformed, even if in only small ways, because you have discovered some new bit of life, some new angle on your existence, some new thing you love and you are bigger and greater than you were before. And this will allow you to bring that new, fresh you to a story that was, was burning out and breathe some life into it again. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're looking at another simple way to do this is also research because dude, just researching something, it can be completely different. It can be you know, within the same realm of what you're writing. But if, if your character does a particular job and you start researching that because you didn't know everything about it, just that can give you a spark. And that spark won't necessarily just carry on through that book. I mean, when you're researching stuff, it's very eye opening and it gives you this knowledge and it gives you this other kind of, kind of, <sighs> It's, it's, it's like the research that you take, you can twist and make it your own kind of secret truth and yes. whether or not the reader knows it or suspects it or whatever, or won't find out until book eight or whatever it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> there, there is these, there are these secret pathways in your brain, you know, that, that you just need to, to chop some, some overgrowth down to find and that opens up these new avenues to different creative outlets you had no idea existed and that that is oh my god that is such a thing as a takeaway right there <laughs> that it is it is that if you have this secret that you're holding for later that fuels everything you're writing in the meantime because you know you know it's sitting out there in the distance, this thing you're writing toward. And and you can drop tiny hints of it. You can just have little things that you know are there. You don't have to touch it until book 15, but you know it's out there. And it it allows you, when you are burned out, when you are stuck, you kind of revisit that little secret thing you have tucked away and look at it as your shining light in the distance. <laughs> And you kind of walk around the obstacle and toward that. <laughs> Sorry. One of the secrets that I have that I'm really looking forward to eventually exposing is mm -hmm. the fact that Standing River's um, stray and pet uh, pee and poo all over the place, be the, being the town known for having the worst pet, uh, quote, biological litter, um, <laughs> end quote, in, in the county, um, is actually the gremlins. Like I am, obviously it's not a secret to any of my readers or, or listeners, any of the listeners, yes. but um, even just that tiny secret, mm -hmm. one of so, so, so many is, is exciting to me. It's, it's exciting. It's funny. It's, it's, I don't know why I'm so, I, I I'm so <laughs> immature and like, and like um, waste humor, but <laughs> The fact that it's going to be mentioned, little drop, the little drops, <laughs> little <laughs> hints here and there and here and there, just throughout a couple of books, and then all of a sudden, the reader who just thought that Standing River was nasty <laughs> is <laughs> is going to find out like, oh wow, it's not the people aren't picking up their pet stuff; it's that these little jerks are leaving their stuff around <laughs> leaving their calling cards as surprises for yeah. people they well, don't like <laughs> it's it's more that they don't 
go in their home because their home area is very limited. So when they're out, they got to release everything. And they don't want to release it near their home because they don't want things to know that there's living beings in this area. So it's a, it's a safety thing. But sure. they are also very mischievous. So, yeah, they're going to put that poop in places that are funny to them. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So um, th- I just want to remind you guys, you can follow us on the socials. That's Alone in a v- Room with Invisible People on Facebook. Alone with Invisible People on Instagram. Uh, A-A, sorry, at A-I-A-R-W-I-P on Twitter and use the hashtag, you know, A-I-A-R-W-I-P to tag us and stuff or use, if you're on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, just tag us in general. Let us know what you're doing. Let us know what you have, um, you know, come up with from different episodes. And please, if you, if you get our merch, because I saw we sold another notebook, let us know, like tag, actually physically tag us. You don't have to just use the air whip hashtag tag us and let us see what you bought because I am such a nerd. I can't wait to see other people have, have the little air whip stuff. Yeah. And we had some of those on the air whip. So I was uh, or on the, on the Instagram. I was so excited. I got, um, somebody tagged me on one of them and I got to see, and that was just so cool. Yeah. 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 I think it was, um, somebody was working on their writing. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. Dude, we get so excited to see you guys working on stuff or getting past, um, you know, burnouts or blocks or uh, if, if, you know, you found a new avenue or a new idea or you're finally taking a leap and, and trying to finish that novel or you do succeed and finish something. Tag us. If, if you use Holly's um, How to Write Flash Fiction That Doesn't Suck course and you get something up tag us oh yeah absolutely it's and you know it wouldn't hurt to include your picture along with whatever you did because it's really nice to be able to put a face to a name (laughs) yes yes we had um a member who has been posting in the tmt area the uh 10 minute timer challenge uh forums and just posting constantly doing a great job and it, he finally put his picture up i was like hey <laughs> there's the face to the you know so and it like yes! we do pay attention we want to know you guys we want we want to support you and we want to encourage you guys and we want to cheer your your good stuff so you know come into the forums at holly's writing classes dot com create a free account you get the automatic flash fiction uh that doesn't suck course three week course you also get summer fiction stuff for free but you get to come into the forums and meet everybody and talk to everybody and we'll be in there as well so there's just different ways i also wanted to say thank you so much to the people who are supporting us on coffee or through paypal it it really warms my heart every time i see that what we are doing is supported you know, it, it, it also, you know, if you guys are sharing our podcast, that's huge too. So we really, really appreciate all of the help that we're getting. And I'm just going to say um, thank you guys. We'll see you again next week. And we love you guys, Holly. Yes. Um, and just remember, no matter how frustrated you get, no matter how burned out you might find yourself, there is a way out. There is a way around it. There is a way to make it fun again. And you can do this.